Ever since the season released on my birthday back in August, Patrick and I have been diligently watching Divorce Court. That may come as a surprise, but we started watching because the new judge, Star Jones, is someone who took me on a few years ago, and I can't even begin to describe how much she does for me. But anyway, so she's, and she's also our daughter's godmother now, which you witnessed a few weeks ago here in church. And that's how that relationship started, and that's how we started watching Divorce Court in support of her. But then I just have to admit, we actually started watching it more consistently because we love it. Now, I'll, tell, I'll let you in on a little secret. I had always, always thought that the people who showed up to Divorce Court were actors, and I thought there were some producers somewhere who wrote out, you know, these dramatic scripts. But that's not, not the case, and it might be on some other shows, but it's not on Divorce Court because their stories are real, and maybe it's because I'm a person who is called to pay attention to stories, or maybe it's just because the show is good, but I have to say that Every time I watch it, I learn. The chief drama in divorce court hinges on the question, can this relationship sustain the mistakes and the conflict that people have made? Can the necessary change in order for them to stay together, can that change take root? Is the forgiveness that would have to be part of that change to be able to move past the embitteredness and the disappointment and the hurt or even the anguish that rests between them. Can that forgiveness be present? Is it present? Or is it exactly where it is right now? Is that where things are going to stay? And I don't think I'm saying anything profound to say that how any of us responds to and reacts to errors made either around us or within our own mistakes. How any of that, how, how we handle any of that, determines exactly what kind of person we are and what kind of person we are going to be, which then, of course, has everything to do with the relationships we'll have and how we experience love. On the show, we hear about someone usually who's done something wrong. Maybe the other did a lot, something really, really wrong, and maybe the other person did too. And they just can't handle it. They can't get past it. And so often, the person who's done the wrong, tell me if you've ever seen or experienced this, I know you have, will say, okay, well, I acknowledge it. I've apologized for it, maybe they'll say. I knew I had done wrong. And just as often, as soon as somebody will say this, Judge Starr will say, well, that's good. Great. I'm glad you know that you did wrong. I'm glad you've done what you're supposed to do. I'm glad you've apologized. That's all very important. And even if the person accepts that apology, she says there are two things. One, they, will, they may have accepted the apology, but it doesn't mean that they're ever going to forget how you made them feel when that thing happened. That's one part. And she also said, if you do accept the apology, you cannot keep bringing it up. It can't just be an incessant reminder. Those are the two things that happen. But no matter what, how we feel about how things that go wrong, that lingers. So, just to broaden this a bit, how, let's say that we've done something wrong. Anyone here ever done something wrong? Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we do something wrong, we, we definitely want to move past it. But maybe the person we've wronged is not ready to move past it. <laughs> Ever experienced that? Yeah. And how both parties respond to that conflict can define just about everything. And so much of that has to do with what we believe about ourselves and what we deserve, and then how that translates to everybody else around us, and that is how I'm looping back to our scripture today. If we think that we deserve to be mistreated, that we deserve to be under the foot or the boot of an abuser, that we believe, as Judge Starr would say, that our place is on the floor 
to be someone else's doormat. Then, right there on the floor is where we will stay. And getting up, getting up from there. Ooh, as I get older, I can't get on the floor so easily. Getting up from there is so hard. Sometimes that boot or that fist fights to violent effect to ensure that we stay right down there. But I want you to know that if that is where you find yourself, God doesn't want you there. God didn't put you there. God in no form. God wouldn't have formed you in the womb, breathed life into you at first breath, blessed you at every turn, granted you every good thing that you've had in your day. God wouldn't have done that for you to end up as a doormat. Someone did that. But it wasn't God, which means you and everyone else who finds themselves there does not deserve to be there, which means that God ordains for you to get up and hold your head proud and to remember that you are heir to God's promises. Do you hear that? You are heir to God's promises, which are good. You are heir to heaven and earth. There is no such thing as a doormat ministry for somebody to be called to. But so many of us are there. And I see you. I know you. I love you. I hope you don't feel shame. But most importantly, God loves you and intends differently for you. That's an example. But then some of us are the ones who put people on the floor. And we're sometimes the ones who do some deep wrong. Some of us do push people down. And maybe we want to, but most of the time I think we don't want to. We just do out of many, many factors. But it happens, and it happens a lot. If you know that you are there, I want you to know that that is not your portion either. God does not intend that for you either. If something about your existence depends on someone else's suffering and pain, that's not living according to God's purpose or word or command to love your neighbor as yourself. Harming a neighbor includes harming yourself. Because spiritually, you're not right with God when this happens. You just aren't. We aren't when that happens. But you can be. We all can. Harming and being harmed happen in our lives, but that's never, ever, ever God's intention for our lives. What is, is healing and that's where I'm going to spend the rest of my short reflections with you. Because when we are committed to healing in our relationship with ourself, in our relationships with someone else, and in our relationship with God, then you're committed to living in God's purpose and plan for your life, and that, that alignment between who you want to be and who God intends you to be, that existence right there is joy. That is pure joy. Being who God intended you to be and feeling fully aligned with that, that is joyous living. And I do, I talk to you a lot about these obstacles we have to joy to getting there. We have that conversation. And for example, like if you're like me, you'll, you'll set a goal and you'll work really hard towards it and you know you're going to be so happy when you reach it. And then when you do, for maybe five seconds, you feel that delight. Maybe 10, maybe five minutes. But it's short-lived. When we feel that we have to accomplish joy, it never happens. And that's because joy, you see, is not a destination. It's not a place to go. It can't be planned. It can't be bought. It is actually instead a state of being. You can't achieve joy, which I hate to say because some of us are really achievers, but that's not how it works. You live joy. 
and I believe that the only way to your true and lasting joy is to live into the truth of who you are, which is a beloved child of God. And if you question your belovedness in any way, if you don't live in that belovedness, then you just can't love somebody else without hurting them, really. If all you know about loving is loving yourself, is hating on yourself, there's just no way that you can offer that love without hating on others as well. Your love can't be complete. You've heard it said that hurt people hurt people, which is true. We just have to be careful not to use it as an excuse. Some hurt people cause a heck of a lot of harm, and we know this to be true. And it's a hurt person who will tell you that you deserve your pain. It's a hurt person who pushes you down and tells you you deserve to be a doormat. It's a hurt person who tells you that you deserve to be enslaved and in shackles. You may even be that person who hurts others with abandon. I have been. Maybe you have too. But I don't get to blame God for the times I've done that, and neither do you. So we can't dare to pick up the scriptures and point to a passage like today's in Galatians and walk away thinking that any of our neighbors deserve to be enslaved or living outside in the cold. We can't pick up the scriptures and read them and decide that God created some to be the doormat and somebody else to tread upon it, even though that's exactly how our culture is structured. We can't read scriptures and, and take who a person is and was born to be and then to turn that against them so that they're always living under the shroud of shame. Far too often, people who claim God do not know God, and they claim to be sanctified, but they hold their false sanctity as a sacred canopy, as Kelly Brown Douglas says, a sacred canopy to their bigotry. And we can't do that. Jesus said of that very type, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And for the life of me, I don't know why he said that. But here is what I've experienced. A perpetrator holds power over us. The ones who nailed Jesus to a cross, they nailed him to a tree. They wielded power over him in a way. Forgive them, Father. The moment he said that, Jesus handed them over and diminished, actually just cut off their power at the root because he handed them to God. He said, the God who is more powerful than any nail or any tree or any crown of thorns or rope, the God who doesn't need those things gets to hold this for us. When we forgive, we pass that power over to the only one who is capable of changing someone fundamentally true. And that person is not us. It's God. But when we forgive, when we hand the power someone has over our lives over to God, we lay it at the altar, it doesn't mean that we forget. We'll probably remember exactly how they made us feel. We, and this is crucial, will do everything we can to protect ourselves so that we do not have to live through that. We need to live and thrive and live in our joy. And let me be very clear that when someone does wrong, sometimes the best thing we can do in that forgiveness process is to say goodbye. But until then, until then, I just want you to know this. Someone can try to take everything from you. But what they can't do, what they're not going to do, is take your joy. Joy is you and God being together and aligned. Joy is yours for the living. And sure, they'll even tell you you should be a slave. But slave is not your name. You hear me? Doormat 
is not your name. Abuser is not your name. Hurt is not your name. Whatever your name is, whatever it is, it translates to mean beloved. Beloved child of God, in whom God says, I am well pleased. Why else would God go to these incredible lengths to do what God did? Why would God risk the vulnerability of birth, birth in exile, birth without a home, birth without protection, all the vulnerabilities of human existence, and then have to run? Why would God risk that? Why else would God walk this earth just to show us what it means for God to be with us, for Emmanuel to walk beside us? Why else would God love you through every single moment of your life and then some? Why else but to show you that heaven is right here, that God will go to any length to be with you? And we live in that love. Love, beloved, in that spirit of joy is your name. What is your name, beloved? Beloved. What is your name, beloved? Beloved. You. I'm asking you right here. What is your name? Beloved. What is your name? Aha, when you forget, you're not in joy, but when you never let hold on to anything but that truth as at the core of your being, then you are in a state of endless joy. In Jesus' name, amen.